new study found that more than two-thirds of Chicago children under six years old may be exposed to lead-contaminated water, and Black and Latino children are especially vulnerable. This is a long-standing issue in this city, which has some 400,000 lead service lines, more than anywhere else in the country. Now, replacing all those lines is expected to take five decades, and that's if the city replaces around 10,000 lead lines a year. The current rate is far lower than that. With residents exposed every day, we're diving into what solutions are needed to get us to zero. Joining us now in studio, Shakina Perry, Senior Policy Advocate for Environmental Health for the Natural Resources Defense Council. Welcome, Shakina. Thank you so much. Also here, Michael Hawthorne, Environment Reporter for the Chicago Tribune. Welcome back, Michael. Great to see you, Sasha. And rounding out our panel is Brenda Santoyo, Water Justice Program Manager for Little Village Environmental Justice Organization. Good to have you with us. Thank you for having me. So, Shakina, I want to start with this study. It was published in the Journal of the uh, American Medical Association Pediatrics and mentioned its findings when it comes to younger children here in Chicago and lead exposure. What was your biggest takeaway, though? My biggest takeaway with the study is it just really underscores the sense of urgency that's needed to speed up the replacement of lead pipes in the city of Chicago. I think we've seen several studies by uh, great journalists and reporters throughout the city that that's keeping a flame to the fire when it comes to this issue. Mm -hmm. um, but this showing that two thirds of children under the age of six, it shows that there's a, a vicious cycle of lead exposure, um, starting with pregnant mothers. And once these children are born, um, they're exposed to lead contaminated water in their households. And then they go to daycares and schools and are going through the same cycle. So if anything, it just really shows that we need to be thinking strategically about yeah. how to speed up this process. And we'll dig more into some of the, the points you raised there, Shakina. Brenda, that, that threshold that the study used was one part per billion, right? Imagine a, a half teaspoon of, of lead in an Olympic-sized swimming pool. Mm -hmm. The federal government uses a different standard. Can you just give us some context about these levels? Yeah, so currently the EPA has a 15 parts per billion action level mm -hmm. uh, for any water system to take action on educating or replacing the lead pipes um, with the presence of lead, right? I th they have currently updated that lead and copper rule to be 10 parts per billion um, in order to take action. It's currently not in effect yet, but we're waiting for the new rule to come into effect, hopefully this this fall. Okay. Um, but that's still 10 parts per billion. Um, it exceeds what the Center for Disease Control um, says is acceptable for lead, right? Yeah. We know that there is no safe level of lead and even um, a, even one part per billion um, can have effects, especially like on children, on pregnant mothers. It could cause miscarriages, infertility. Um, we're seeing a lot of like attention deficit disorders and learning mm. disabilities from children. And I think a lot of the times like people don't make that connection between uh, lead, contamin lead contaminated water in their home yeah. and like the health impacts that they're having in their home. And many people are going to go without even knowing that that's like something that's um, impacting them. Yeah. Uh, a statement from the city reads in part, it, it says that it offers free water testing and takes action by sending a plumber, sanitary engineer, and electrician to homes that test over the federal benchmark for lead in drinking water, which is the 15 um, uh, parts per billion that you mentioned, Brenda. Uh, Michael, let's bring you in here. Why are there so many lead pipes in Chicago in the first place? Well, the plumbing code required it until Congress banned the practice in 1986. That's number one. Um, there's reporting by myself and former WBZ reporter Monica Eng that found that the plumbers union was essentially co-opted by the lead industry, which was once very uh, present here in Chicago. And um, while other cities, Boston, for example, New York, um, went away from that practice before World War II, mm -hmm. uh, we kept doing it. And so any home or, or, um, or two flat, three flat sometime, in some cases that was built before 1987 likely has likely is getting their water through a lead straw, essentially, a lead service line that conveys water from the main underneath the street uh, to the home. And what, you know, there's so many things that are just so frustrating about this, not just the decisions that were made in the past, but more recently. So we had Mayor Emanuel, Mayor Lightfoot, have they've they borrowed hundreds of millions of dollars to replace water mains because many of them are old and leaking. Yeah. 
And that's very important. Conservation, very important. We only get to take so much water from Lake Michigan every day as a region. So that was a big step towards conserving water. The thing of it is they would go around the city digging up streets and when they would install the new water main, yeah. they would hook it up to the same lead service lines. They didn't pull them out then. So there was a great opportunity, probably for a little less money than what they're going to end up spending by going back onto those same streets right. and tearing up the streets again and then replacing and the lead service lines. what you just lines. described just, just defeats the purpose. It sure seems like it. And so what happened um, is because of the kind of the Byzantine way that federal regulations work – that 15 parts per billion mentioned, uh, that doesn't actually trigger any kind of action. They get to average that out. And there's only certain official regulatory testing that is mm -hmm. done. Uh, we reported back in 2016 that uh, Chicago, more lead service lines, as we talked about, than any city in the country. Right. They only have, have to test 50 homes every three years. And most of the homes that the water department is traditionally used for this testing are owned by water department employees right. or retirees on the far northwest or far southwest sides, not really representative of the city. Yeah. And so these this, these testing kits that you mentioned, that was the data that, that the Johns Hopkins researchers tapped into. I looked at that, an earlier version of that, back in 2018. There's lead and water detected through those kids in every neighborhood area in this city. Yeah. So it's, and it's, what's, what's perplexing is it's intermittent. And so you can't predict it. So each one of those tests is essentially a snapshot. So some days could be more, some days could be less. Yeah. The city's replaced uh, 5,395 lead pipes so far. This is according to the Depart uh, Department of Water Management. Talk us through, Shakina, what the pace of replacement has looked like, because that doesn't sound like it's enough. Definitely. I think in the grand scheme of things, knowing that we have around 409,000 known lead service signs, that's a really small number. I do want to give the Johnson administration some credit because um, early on he laid out a Green New Deal for water that showed that by 2027, their administration plans to replace around 44,000 lead pipes. And so that's going to be in combination of with water main breaks. So anytime a water main breaks, the lead service line will be replaced. Mm -hmm. And then also the, the separate efforts that are taking place, whether it's the different programs that they offer at the um, Chicago Department of Water Management or people opting in to replace their line. They, they have outlined a plan. The problem is, is that, you know, how do we speed up this replacement knowing that the costs are um, higher on average compared to uh, other cities who've already done this work and have done it well. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we're around $30,000 for a single replacement in the city of Chicago. And when we're thinking about federal funding and how it's limited, as well as the loans that we're taking out, um, $30,000 per line uh, doesn't allow that money to stretch really far. Yeah. Um, so how do we get those cost numbers down so we can not only speed up the replacement, but also make sure that's affordable? As I mentioned, Brenda, this uh, issue especially impacts our Black and Latino communities, as well as low-income residents. So talk more about how equity fits into this issue. Yeah, so the study showed that Black and Brown uh, communities were less likely to be tested for lead and more likely to have lead in their water. Um, they are also less likely to be able to pay for the lead service line replacement. Um, these communities also have a high percentage of renters and landlords have no incentive to replace the lead service lines in their home. So that's another issue. The current like program that the city offers is an opt-in program that has certain regulations to be able to replace a lead service line. Yeah. Um, and there's no program that incentivizes renters to take part in that. Um, so one thing that like we've seen in, in other cities is... Um, to have an opt out program where everybody gets their lead service line replaced and you would opt like opt out of getting your um, lead service line replaced. That, that happened in Newark, New Jersey, and that really helped speed up that process. It also really helped with that um, equity issue uh, where there was absentee landlords that were not taking action and removing the lead service lines in the homes of um, yeah. low-income homeowners. You think or, we could do something like that here? I think it's necessarily, it's possible. I mean, currently there is uh, an ordinance that Alder, Alderman Villegas has proposed uh, to have like a pilot program of something of that sort where we go block by block replacing lead service lines um, and it would be like an opt-out service. I yeah. think that it's, it, the, the ordinance 
might need some work, but I think it's definitely possible. And I think if we're able to identify sources of funding that can help like pay for that, I think that we can definitely do that. Mm -hmm. I think the other issue when it comes to like lead service science and uh, black and Latino communities is also the understanding of what lead even is. I mean, at El Bejo, we do a lot of like community engagement and resource fairs where we talk to folks and we're the first people that tell them like, hey, you have a lead service line in your home. These are the actions that you should take to mitigate the harm, especially if you have children. Right. And um, a lot of the times people are like, oh, my God, like, I didn't know and that. What like, is that? And I'm shocked. Right. And like, what can I even do? Right. Um, so I, I, I definitely think that we need to like improve, like just like the community engagement and the public education piece, because if you're telling people the le the, the water that we're drinking in Chicago is safe people aren't going to have an incentive to want to replace their lead service lines. Right. And we should be equipping them with the tools to be able to, um, one, just protect their families and also increase participation in the programs that already exist in right. the city. Mm -hmm. It's more than just the awareness piece at yeah. that point. Um, I want to circle back to something you, you mentioned earlier, Shakina, because we are focusing today on the health outcomes of children, of course, which you, we know that they're especially vulnerable. But you brought up the health of mothers earlier. Say more on that. For sure. I think um, when we talk about lead service line replacement, we can get into the weeds and get really wonky about what that looks like and what that means and focusing particularly on like the contractor's work. But this is a public health crisis. Uh, this is also an environmental justice issue. And so we have to really censure um, the individuals who are most impacted. And so when we think about pregnant mothers, Brenda had already alluded to this, um, but even pre-birth pre or during pregnancy, um, mothers who are exposed to contaminated drinking water uh, can be at risk for low birth weight, um, permanent damage to nervous systems and of, of the fetus. Mm. Um, even when children are born, uh, even the lowest level of exposure can lead to behavioral issues and emotional issues that children have to navigate for decades, um, right, of, of them being alive. Yeah. And so when we see these type of numbers of two thirds of children under the age of six exposed, you know, we're not giving kids a fair shot to really lean into their full selves and actually um, go through the developmental process um, in a way that's health, healthy and um, safe. And so how are we making sure we're mitigating this early on? Um, and that requires coordination from all different city departments to make sure that we're speeding this up as quickly as possible. If you're just tuning in, this is Reset. I'm Sasha Ann Simons. Chicago still has more lead service lines than anywhere else in the country, and it's impacting more than two-thirds of Chicago children who are under six years old. So we're talking solutions with Shakina Perry, who's a senior policy advocate for environmental health for the Natural Resources Defense Council, Michael Hawthorne, who's an environment reporter at the Chicago Tribune, and Brenda Santoyo, who's a water justice program manager for Little Village Environmental Justice Organization. Michael, the city's put this particular focus on daycares. Let's talk about that. I mean, what can you tell us about those efforts? And I wonder if you think there's anywhere else that they should be given this sort of extra attention. Yeah, so a state law required this to be a priority. You know, again, it's been kind of slow, mm. especially with the— So uh, do, does it not look like it's a priority so far? Well, and it's just like the the overall program. It's They've done some work, but it's just not enough. So they have placed an emphasis on these home daycares— in part, so there's like a funding stream separate from these other funding streams devoted to that, but the pace is really slow. And I think Brenda brought up a really good point that when folks don't know that they're being exposed, in most cases, you can't see the lead in your water. You know, the Flint water crisis back in 2015 yeah. was not just lead, it was also everything in the pipe started coming through. And so people, you saw these very, uh, like the, the water alarming pictures brown of brown and, and yeah. green water. So, you know, you knew something was wrong in Flint right there. We don't necessarily know that here. And it's much like the lead paint problem, which is still a lingering problem here in Chicago because we have a lot of older housing. Most of the time, it's the dust that is that children are ingesting. And so if you talk to city health officials, they'll still say mm -hmm. that lead-based paint is the main risk factor. Yeah. The problem is we only know that because when children are diagnosed with lead poisoning. So we're not doing the proactive work as a city, as a nation really, yeah. to prevent this. And, and, and this is where it really gets at the disparity between 
the largely white, wealthy population of Chicago and black and Latino neighborhoods. Back in 2015, I found that in certain census tracts in the city, black and Latino census tracts, mm -hmm. mostly on the south and west sides, the rate of lead poisoning was actually going up after many years of decline, whereas in predominantly white neighborhoods, it had all but disappeared. Interesting. And, and whether that was from lead-based paint or from water, they still can't tease that out. The city likes to tell you that it's all just the lead paint issue. But because, once again, like I said before, that the lead and water can be so intermittent, that is another potential source of exposure, and you don't know when you're getting it because you can't see it. So how do we speed this up? We, we talked about how this replacement process is moving so slowly. Brenda, you talked about this that opt-out program that happened in, in other cities across the country. I mean, anyone else have thoughts about making this happen faster for us here in Chicago, Shigena? For sure. I think we, we have different blueprints that have already been laid out for us. Uh, we have Benton Harbor, Michigan, who is a neighbor of us here in the Midwest. And then we can look in Newark, New Jersey, who um, they replaced around 27,000 lead service signs and way quicker than we're doing here in Chicago. Um, and they did it efficiently and equitably. Mm -hmm. um, I think Brenda had already touched on, you know, doing the block by block uh, replacements versus these one offs that we're currently doing. Not yeah. only will it save the city money, it would also increase efficiency. Uh, Newark was really um, unique in the sense that they required require utility finance or utility funded lead service line replacement. So they really tapped into the equity issue here because having the water utility pay for the full cost of replacement um, really alleviated um, the financial burden that, I see. you know, that everyday residents had to take on. Yeah. Um, and also the right to entry provision um, about allowing residents to provide contractors permission to replace their lead pipe versus actually um, having to chase down landlords. Right. I think having all three of those uh, strategic decisions in place um, really allow us to get that work done efficiently and equitably. It's just a matter of political will in the city of Chicago, as well as, you know, strategic visioning to figure out what work what will work here and what won't. Yeah. But we need to give it a chance. Yeah, because costs for replacement are high, right? Michael? Yeah, I mean, uh, it, they've been high in most cities that have started this. And then over time, they they find ways of becoming more efficient. The good news in Chicago, they've learned, or maybe they've learned from other other communities, that instead of digging up the whole street, they can punch a hole in the street, and they have a machine that essentially pulls out the lead line mm -hmm. while putting the, uh, a safer copper line in the house. And so you have a crew that hooks it up on one end, hooks it up on the other end, boom done I see. and like brenda and shakir said that it's like you can you can do that boom 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 and they've the city did that in a block in little village uh early last year wasn't it yeah, brenda 31st and ridgeway yeah, 31st and ridgeway and i was there that day and you know you had some people who, who opted out yeah but they just went down the block and 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 got it done and one thing that always sticks out to me that i haven't seen so much from the chicago department of water management that we've seen in other cities, and what comes to mind is Detroit, also Newark. Well before they were planning to, to replace water lead service lines on a particular block, they would have people, you know, pull up lawn chairs, just talk to the neighborhood, and, and, and you know, answer questions. We haven't really seen that yet too mm -hmm. much. And so I think that was also something with the with the Ridgeway project, they just kind of sprung it on folks really quickly. Yeah. And some people were just, you know, it just really, you're going to dig up my yard. I don't, I don't think I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm 80 years old. You know, I haven't died yet. Blah, blah, blah. You know, all this people other kind of stuff. Right. That. And yeah. so that outreach is something that I think the city of Chicago could do a much better job of. Yeah, a spokesperson for the Department of Water Management says the, the city has introduced corrosion control to mitigate lead and offers free water testing and also has five programs to remove service lines. You can check out resources at leadsafechicago.org or you can call 311. Brenda, how can we improve messaging to, to residents to understand how to keep their families safe? Yeah. You talked a bit about what you've been doing in Little Village. Yeah, I think it's just more of... Um, taking that proactive approach, right? Like if you don't know if you have a lead service line, there's an inventory online where you could look up your address. You can look up your address, see if you have a lead service line. If it's suspected to be lead, you know, try to use a water filter. There's 
uh, specific water filters that should be used to actually remove out the lead. I think the ones that the city provides are zero water filters. You could also buy those at like a Target or at, like any store. Um, and just making sure that like you're uh, taking preventative measures uh, to protect like yeah. that water. Um, I think the city, like Michael just alluded to, needs to do a lot better at like just connecting with folks. I think that there's they need to bridge like that like trust gap that they have with like their customers in order to be able to run an effective program in order for each neighbor to like tell like their neighbors to you know get their lead service line replaced for free if they can right i think that that's something that has been successful in like other cities right um i think they need to be showing up to like community events and being a more public facing department and making it known that this is an issue that needs to be addressed an issue that is like a priority for the city to um you know, conquer. Yeah, <laughs> I think yeah. this is, there's no other city in the country that has a challenge as big as Chicago does, but I think we know better and we should be doing better uh, yeah. to make sure that we're protecting the public health of like people throughout Chicago. We mentioned this early on, a 2021 state law requires Chicago to remove all lead pipes within 50 years and the EPA's lead and copper rule could put Chicago you know, uh, under a slightly tighter timeline. Shakina, are we actually on track to do even that? For sure. I think with the, the lead and copper rule improvements um, was unveiled a couple months ago. Uh, advocates across uh, the country have you know, submitted public comment. Residents have been engaged. So we're waiting right now to um, figure out what the actual rule is going to look like. We're in the finalization period of that right now. Yeah. Uh, but Chicago was one of the handful of cities that receive an extension to replace their lead service signs, while majority of the country if the rule remains intact, will have to replace their lead lines within 10 years. Chicago, as mentioned, was already on a 50-year timeline. We around a 45 to 55-year um, extension from the EPA. Mm -hmm. And I think advocates across the country are just saying, you know, if you are in a city like Chicago, like Chicago-based advocates, like we need to shorten the timeline. Um, it's unconscionable to tell residents that they have to wait decades or generations for safe drinking water. And so I think the, all of those pieces that we've mentioned today uh, yeah. will allow us to get closer to that, that vision. Uh, but 50 plus years is unacceptable. We'll have to leave it there for now. We've been talking with Shakina Perry, who's Senior Policy Advocate for Environmental Health for the Natural Resources Defense Council, Michael Hawthorne, who's an environment reporter at the Chicago Tribune, and Brenda Santoyo, who's a Water Justice Program Manager for Little Village Environmental Justice Organization. Thank you all so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.